There's this famous phrase that I've heard several times in several different instances, and it is, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Have you heard that? Yeah, I have. I want to talk about that today. I want to tell you about a topic that I've researched, and I'm not just talking about like I've researched it casually, like read an article. Like I've spent time at the physical location where this happened, and uh, it's the Battle of Mobile Bay. Have you ever heard of this battle in the U.S. Civil War? I've heard of it two ways. One, I heard of it just, you know in school and reading about the Civil War and teaching about the Civil War. But two, I heard about it because you quoted one of the belligerents in that battle in some kind of earlier episode where we were talking about it. You gave him credit for saying some kind of full speed ahead, we're charging into the fray kind of thing. And so I, I know that this is a battle that you're familiar with and that you care about, and you know way more about it than I do. I want to lay the groundwork to begin with to help you understand why this is such an important thing to me. So I grew up in the American South in Alabama. And when you grow up in like the northern Alabama area, it, it, there's like a triangle between Kentucky, you know, northern Alabama and Atlanta that y you just kind of grow up knowing about Civil War battlefields. And so as a young man, you know, cross country driving, you'll stop at Vicksburg, for example, and down in Mississippi, and you'll you'll learn about the siege at Vicksburg and you'll learn about all these different things, right? Sure. I've been there. Neat place. Yeah, it's cool. When I was younger, my grandfather used to take me down to a place in Alabama called Gulf Shores. It's a, a white, sandy beach. It's beautiful. And, I mean, just like sugary sand. I've been to beaches all over the world, and I always want to go back to that stretch of the Gulf of Mexico because the beaches are unlike anything. The water's like bath water. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. It's very different than anywhere else I've been. Down there in Gulf Shores, there's this little... I don't know, if you were to look at a map of the United States and you were to look at Alabama, you'll notice that there's this little section of Alabama that goes down into the bay. It's called Mobile Bay. It's the Gulf of Mexico there. And it looks like a little Pac-Man mouth, and it stretches down into the Gulf of Mexico. And you'll notice that there's these really wispy little pieces of land on each side of that bay. It's a natural protective area for that bay, and that's an area called... Fort Morgan, Alabama. You've okay. got the east side and the west side. So on the east side, to the right as you're looking at the map, you've got this long, narrow stretch of land that comes out. And at the very tip of that, that's where Fort Morgan, Alabama is. And on the other side of the bay, on the west side, left as you're looking at the map, there's this place called Fort Gaines. It's uh, called Dauphin Island, D-A-U-P-H-I-N, Dauphin Island. Dauphin, not dolphin. Correct. Right? Not, not the animal. You're correctly? Okay. Yes, correct. So I'm kind of picturing like two pinball flippers, and the gap in between is the entrance to this Mobile Bay. That is the perfect explanation. That, that's a great way to think about it. You could think about all these different geographical places on the map. And in the middle of a, a large conflict, if you wanted to control a bay, being able to control the tips of those pinball flippers would be a gigantic strategic advantage, right? Yeah, I want to tell you about something called the Battle of Mobile Bay. And to give you an idea of how long this has been ingrained in my consciousness, when I was in fourth grade, I wrote a paper. And this was the first time I ever realized that you could study a moment in history and you can study the effects that that had on the rest of the, rest of the world. And this paper I wrote in fourth grade, it may have been fifth, I don't know, but I would give a lot of money to find this paper but I wrote a paper about the advances of naval technology during the American Civil War. In fourth grade? In fourth grade. You want to know what I wrote about for my fourth grade paper that I remember? What? Ospreys. My paper was entitled Ospreys, and it went something like this. Ospreys are a very important bird. They eat fish. They are neat. I think they are pretty. I like ospreys, and I think that's what I turned in. So you were writing about advances in naval technology at the same time that I wrote a paper about a bird I like? First of all, I don't believe you. I believe you're writing more, <laughs> more complicated things than that, because I know you've always been really good with words. But I was able to read about different types of boats and ships at the time and how this is when they went to like steam-driven ships you know, in a, mm -hmm. in a really real way. This is when they first started working on ironclads. You know, you've heard of the Monitor versus the Merrimack. You've heard of that? Sure, yeah. yeah. Students of Civil War history will know that, oh, I, I called it the Monitor versus the, the Merrimack. I didn't use the other names. Do you know the other the other names? Uh, turtle? 
and oh my goodness, it was a recommissioned ship. And so they looked very different. I mean, they were, ah, oh, I do, and I can't pull it, fix my problem. One of them was the Virginia, and uh, the other one was, oh, what was the other one? I forget the name of them. So, yeah, I was wondering if you Wasn't did. Wasn't the nickname the turtle, though? Like, didn't, no. they, didn't they just call it that informally? No, the, the turtle was actually a submarine that was developed during the Revolutionary <sighs> War. Yeah. Okay. It was the, the first, you know, the, the first attempt at a submarine and to sink something with a torpedo. This was in my paper as well, because the Confederate submarine, the Hunley, was actually used during the American Civil War, and that was created or, or designed and built in Mobile, Alabama, interestingly. So part of the advantage, then, of protecting those two flippers is that you can put a shipyard in there. You could do all kinds of things in protected water where you're not getting just buried by the forces of the sea or buried by the forces of your enemy. So this is a very important staging ground, is the point. Yeah, there's tons of reasons why you want to protect that bay. You know, you have access to shipping goods coming in and out. So the Union, the North, they had this really interesting strategy that was very effective, and that's we're going to tighten the steel buckle around the South. And we're going to start by mm -hmm. going down and, and taking over all the ports. It was a very well-run campaign to just choke out the life from the South. And, you know, controlling ports was a major part of that. Let's get to the Battle of Mobile Bay. All right. So the Battle of Mobile Bay, for the purposes of this discussion, and, and to keep this simple, let's just focus on taking over the bay. The U.S. Admiral, his name is David Farragut, F-A-R-R-A-G-U-T, there's a whole class of 20th century ships named after him, right? Oh, I don't know. I, d I actually didn't know I that. I think so. Yeah. I think there's a Farragut class, maybe destroyer. Uh, th that sounds right to me. Something like that. Oh, I did not know that. So you've got Farragut on one side, and he's got a ton of boats. So he's got 12 wooden boats, he's got two gunboats, and he has four ironclad monitors. Do you know how that compares to other amassings of fleets? in the Civil War? Because I don't. No, I don't. I mean, it seems really significant for the resources and manpower and money that was invested. I mean, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the largest amassing of vessels in the whole war. It wouldn't surprise me at all. It's, it's a ton. Like, it is an absolute, I mean, it's several tons, in fact. So that's what you got on one side. You've got okay. Admiral Farragut, and his objective is to take over the bay. So on the right pinball flipper, you have a fort, a star-shaped fort named Fort Morgan. And Fort Morgan is a converted fort that had been created earlier uh, for the Battle of, or excuse me, the War of 1812. It was called Fort Bowyer. And so uh, okay. they hastily made a fort down there. At one point, it was controlled by the French. At another point, it was controlled by the Spanish. And then the British took it. I mean, it's just like strategically, this is the spot you want. Sure. Four flags over Mobile. At one point, there were five different, if you consider, uh, the CSA, the Confederate States of America, if you considered them a nation, which some people argue they never were, then there would have been five flags that have flown over that area in history. So on the right pinball flipper, we have Fort Morgan. On the left pinball flipper, we have Fort Gaines. Fort Gaines is all the way across the bay, but the problem is the water's much shallower over there. Not only that, the Confederates came in. They're like, okay, we have to protect the gap between the pinball flippers. So what we're going to do is on the left side there, because it's shallower, easier to do stuff, we're going to come in here and we're going to put obstacles in line there. We have sandbars we can work with. We're just going to throw junk down there where you can't take a boat up there. There, It's not navigable. And also, we're going to make them come really, really close. If anybody wants to come in this bay, they're going to have to come as close to that right pinball flipper as possible, as close to Fort Morgan. Clever. Because we have a, an incredible amount of guns on the Fort Morgan side. Far more in Morgan than Gaines, I assume. Correct. Far more okay. in Morgan than Gaines. And what they did is they laid these naval torpedoes. Now, back in the day, a torpedo was not something you shot out of a submarine and it ran up to a boat and then exploded. It was something that was chained to the bottom of the bay, and it floated up there at the top. We would call them naval mines. So think about the, right. the lexicon has changed. Right. Instead of being a, a naval torpedo, this was a naval mine. But they used the term torpedoes back in the day. You with me? Yes, tracking. So there were two types of these torpedoes. There were the singer type and the reins type. So the Singer type okay. looks like a can, 
imagine like a paint can that's much bigger and it's chained to the bottom of the of the sea and it has this little release spring mechanism that when you pull this thing out it'll release a firing pan and detonate right and then you have the reins type which is like an oak barrel this is kind of what you think about with gi joe only the sides of it are tapered the reins type was an oak barrel that was sealed on the inside with pitch and it had this little contact thing on top and when the tube was crushed when it hit something it would release this chemical and it would make the keg explode these are scary things, right? They're huge. It's funny because I've never known how aquatic minds work. I've, I've just never thought about it. But as you're describing it, I'm drawing on all of these scenes from G.I. Joe cartoons and that the hovercraft that G.I. Joe had with the little barrels, the depth charges that they would roll into the water. And I'm picturing some scenes from Star Fox 64. <laughs> and so it all jives with what you're saying. I've just never connected the dots before. So you, so you got two types of minds. I'm just resetting here now. You got two types of mines that are mostly on the right side of the channel as you're looking north, entering Mobile Bay. And you got a bunch of junk and sandbars and crap on the left side near Fort Gaines, the shallow side. The idea is to funnel any would-be attacker to the right to where all the heavy guns are at Fort Morgan and where the torpedoes or the mines are sitting. Am I, am I with you so far? Yeah, you're with me. And, and there's a, a triple row of these torpedoes. They had buoys laid out, and red buoys, and then there was one black buoy. And the black buoy represented, hey, if you if you go to the other side of that black buoy, then you're in the torpedo field. You're going to hit these naval mines, and you're all going to die. Because the Confederates still wanted to be able to use the bay, obviously, you know, because that's right. what you need a bay for. And so, mm-hmm. so they had this clearly marked, and it was just well understood, like, hey, torpedoes are over there, not here. Everybody, everybody cool? Okay, this is what we're going to do. There's this huge campaign that's going, and everybody knows that this battle's going to happen. Everybody on both sides. How do they know? I mean, strategically, it was, you know, they had the telegraph at the time. It just was a thing. Everybody knew that this was going to come to a head. If they want to take over the South, they got to get Mobile Bay. Well, and every other port that mattered was accounted for at this point, right? So when are we talking? This is summer of 1864? 1864, that's right. And it is the summer? Uh, Yes, it is the summer. This is August. Okay, so August of 1864, Sherman would have just been in the process of his Atlanta campaign. So he's coming down from Chattanooga, Battle of Lookout Mountain, all of that stuff that's in your neck of the woods, coming toward Atlanta, which he's going to burn. And then in the late fall, early winter is the fateful death blow by land to the south and that's going to be Sherman's March. What do they call it down there? Sherman's March to the Sea. It's the Savannah campaign. Mm-hmm. And he's going to go from Atlanta to Savannah and live off the land and scorched earth and just torch everything. Pretty much. So I don't remember this for sure, but it looks like the North is doing like a two pronged attack thing, try and limit everything the South can do by sea and then choke out the political and manufacturing capital. So, yeah. So, okay. I guess I'm tracking. I could see how that would be inevitable at this point in the game. Interestingly, there's a little bit of family history that goes along with the campaign that you were just talking about. So there was an orphan after Sherman's March to the Sea. There were all these children that were just left without parents or anything, and people from all over the South went and would adopt these children. The family lore in our family is that the Sandlins were a particularly ugly group. Oh, come on. Until we, at some point, we adopted this one, I forget her name, but we adopted as a family this this child from that area, and you know she came in and she brought some good genes into the Sandlin, <laughs> the Sandlin group. So that was, uh, yeah, I, I think that's pretty funny. Anyway, so you guys so, have very positive memories of Sherman's March, then. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so we've got the scene set for the battle, right? Yes. Okay, so the thing about the battle is inside the bay. If you're Farragut, what are you thinking? Like, how, how do you take over the bay? You've got mm. this big fort. you got to get in there. you got these torpedoes. What are your thoughts going to be? What, what's your strategy? Well, I know that he won, so whatever he did seems like the good idea, but I don't remember what he did. If it were me, I would have tried to shell the forts, but those those are those star-shaped forts, right? Yeah. They both are? Uh, yeah. I mean, Fort Morgan, for the sake of this discussion, let's just talk about Fort Morgan, because it was the only one that was seen in the action. The guns were too far away. 
at Fort Gaines to aid in the battle for the Confederates at all. Okay. So let's just talk about Fort Morgan. Okay. So generally speaking, if you can just bring in more guns and shell something to death, that's great. But those star forts are kind of the pinnacle achievement of deflection and withstanding bombardment. So you could have been there for years lobbing shells at that place. Not really. I disagree. Because this was right after the invention of rifled guns. When you had a cannon and you could just lob shells at a fort, an earthen, you know, brick and earth works type fort, you know, that's great. And they make them in this star shape so that hopefully you could bounce some of the cannonballs out, things like that. But with the invention of the rifled barrel in an artillery piece, you have the ability to hit the same spot over and over and over. Hmm. And once you can do that, forts aren't that big of a deal anymore. Because <laughs> you can be like, hmm, which And that's wall, why there which... is no next step in forts after that. That's right. The forts aren't built to withstand barrages anymore. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Exactly. Okay, so my first strategy sucked. We're not going to do that. The second strategy, uh, you would need some kind of detachment from Sherman or I, Grant is in Virginia at this point, locked in with Lee. So Grant's not an option. I don't know who all's in the South right now. You need somebody knocking on the back door to create pressure. And I guess you just have to get through the bay, right? Yeah, you just got to get in there. And this is the problem for Farragut. So you've got all these boats out there that you got to shoot the gap. And inside the bay, there are four Confederate ships. One of those ships is literally the most powerful ship in the world at the time. It's the Confederate ironclad, the CSS Tennessee. I've heard of the Tennessee. This thing is devastating. The sidewalls of the Tennessee are two foot thick, five inches of that being iron, and they're all sloped. So if you're able to manage a a hit with a cannonball on this thing, it's going to bounce up and away. Because it's almost like a submarine. Most of it is below water. What is above water is heavily, heavily armored. It's an impressive looking piece of engineering. What kind of guns did it have? Was it offensively potent? Oh, yes, no doubt. It had, I think it was six rifled guns, and it had plenty of others. I don't know the exact number that it had, but, I mean, this thing was legit. And so everybody knows the Tennessee is serious. On top of that, on that boat, you have this admiral named Buchanan. Buchanan was just an ornery son of a gun, man. He was not going to go down without a fight, and everybody knew that. So Farragut has to think about Buchanan in the Bay, in the CSS Tennessee, and he also think, has to think about Page, General Page, which is Robert E. Lee's cousin, manning Fort Morgan. So here's how the battle goes down. The morning of, and by the way, the other day I went there at this time, the battle started early in the morning. It was about 647 is when the first shot was fired by the Tecumseh, which was the ship at the, the head of Farragut's column. So Farragut's strategy okay. was, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Wait, I'm the gonna... ship was called the Tecumseh? The Tecumseh, yes. So that's Sherman's middle name. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, that's fantastic. And that was named for a, an 1812, War of 1812, maybe, Indian leader. I'm making stuff up now, but I think that's right. Like, uh, Sherman got the name because it's just so badass. So the Tecumseh, seriously, that's awesome. Tecumseh versus Tennessee, I'm fascinated. Yeah, but I don't think it was named after Sherman. So what's going on here is you've got Farragut. He's like, okay, here we go. And he gives instructions to all of his people. And he's like, I want you to stay away from the torpedoes, and I just want you to shoot the gap. We're just going to get rained on by the fort, and let's go straight in there and see what we we got to do. The big players rolling in were the Tecumseh, the Metacomet, the Brooklyn, the Hartford, and uh, the Richmond and the Oneida. These are all ships that Farragut has. What type of ships? There's several different types. You've got the the steamships. You've got these ironclad monitors, gunboats, just straight up wooden ships that have cannons on them. You've got all kinds of stuff at your disposal if you're Farragut. So this is like one of those wonky moments when you're playing Civilization and you've got stuff from like five different eras all amassed together and you just got to use it all. Yeah, pretty much. So Farragut starts rolling up in there. The Union took the first shot. And once they started shooting, think about it. You're sitting in the fort. You're a Confederate soldier. You've done nothing but practice with your cannon over and over and over to make sure you could hit what you wanted to hit. Hmm. And so you know 
how to sight this thing, you know how to range it, you know how to set the timing on the fuses so these exploding shells would explode when you wanted them to. Some of them, you might have even had contact fuses. There's a lot going on here. And so here's how it went down. They started rolling up in, and on the ship, the Tecumseh, you've got this guy named Craven. Craven is in control of the Tecumseh, and he rolls up in. And for some reason, nobody knows why, Commander Craven doesn't do what Farragut told him to. Hmm. He says, hey, stay to the right of the torpedoes, go straight in, we're going after the Tennessee. Tecumseh shot first. Once it shot, it started rolling up in. This was at 6.47 a.m. By the way, I went there at 6.47 a.m. I flew a drone out over the bay. If you were looking along the top side of the right pinball flipper, you would have had the sun in your face. Oh, nice job. I don't think that's where the Tennessee was. I think the Tennessee was further up inside to the left, so I don't think you were actually looking at the sun. But if you're looking back at that fort, the sun is an issue. Good original historying, man. Nice job. Fascinating. Thanks, Thanks, man. So the Tecumseh shoots first, and for some reason, Craven doesn't do what he's supposed to do, and he goes straight into the torpedo field, and he hits a torpedo, and he explodes, and he starts sinking. Disappointing. And they all died. Craven died. There were 114 people on the Tecumseh, and only 21 of them were saved. And so you're Farragut. You're a few boats back on the Hartford, and you see Craven, your friend, who you just gave an order, and he, for whatever reason he disobeyed the order, whether it was because he was confused or whether he was gun ho and wanted to go after the Tennessee himself, he just died, and you saw it, and you saw him do it via exploding on the torpedoes. So at that moment in time, you have faith that those torpedoes are going to do what they're supposed to do. They're going to kill boats, right? Right. But another thing happens. There's an issue because the boats start to get blocked up. You've got the Brooklyn is in there, and the Brooklyn gets caught up behind this. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. It starts trying to back up. And so all of a sudden, you get this traffic jam of all these boats. They're confused. Craven's dying. All his men are dying. Their body's in the water. You got a traffic jam. And where do you have the traffic jam? In a minefield? In the sights. Within range of a fort? Of a fort (laughs) armed with 20 cannons or however many cans it is. And the only thing these rebels have been training to do and wanting to do for, you know, however long they've been there is kill Union sailors. And you just stopped, and you're in a traffic jam right there. To quote one of the rebels at the fort, they said, we saw them clog up, and we punished them badly. Mm -hmm. And so I saw an image of what happened on the Brooklyn, which was in that traffic jam, how many times it got hit. It was incredible. We're talking like 20 direct hits. They were hitting the smokestack. They were hitting the side. I mean, to hear the person that was on board explain what it was like, I have to find this quote because it's incredible. What I want to do is pause here for just a second and let you read what it was like on that before we hear the famous quote from Admiral Farragut, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And over the course of this episode, I want to walk you step by step into the exact moment where he uttered those words, well, supposedly uttered those words, and I want to explain what he may have been feeling in that moment, because you're going to hear this quoted a lot, and I want you to understand what people are quoting it as and what it may actually have meant. Hmm. Yeah, a little mystery. Okay, I'm in. Hey, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Raycon. Destin, what's, what's a Raycon? Oh, Raycon, these little earbuds that are part of my everyday carry. I wake up in the morning, throw the wallet in, um, you know, put my multi-tool on my belt, and I put the Raycons in my pocket and get on with my day. They're Bluetooth, wireless earbuds, and they're great. They're at a great price point. I really like them to the point where they're part of my everyday carry. You have some, right? What color did you get? I got the black ones in the little black bean carry case. And a lot of the earbuds that I see, the case is just clunky and it's not fun. This is so ergonomically perfect. It's got little magnets. So if I get anywhere near it with the earbuds when it's open, it just sucks them in and starts charging them. And then it's so satisfying when it clips shut and I just slide that thing into my pocket. I drag it around with me all the time. And then if I want to do anything athletic, active, or I end up sitting in a waiting room for a few minutes, I want to watch videos or listen to podcasts. 
They're just right there all the time. So this is the thing that has taken me from being a person who sometimes has earbuds around to always has the ability to plug in around if I need to. Yeah, they're awesome. The specific model that I recommend is called the Everyday E25. You get six hours of playtime on the earbuds, and you can charge the earbuds four times with the little case they come in. So you charge the case, and the case charges the earbuds. And one last time on the, the promo code there, Matt. Yeah, so to get the Everyday E25, you can go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ. You get 15% off your order. That's all it takes. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ. And the magic of this is these things sound just as amazing as other top audio brands, but they hit the price point. That's the sweet spot for this product. If you lose them because you're doing something crazy or they fall like in that little place between your seat and your console and your car and you never find them again, it's not going to ruin your entire finances because they're priced right in that sweet spot. And for my money, these are my favorite earbuds in terms of sound because the low end, it's not muddy or cluttered up. It has some punch to it. It's resonant. You get to feel the music, which is important to me even though it's not coming through a big giant speaker. So I, I prefer the sound of the Raycons over anything else I've used. Yeah, I do too. They have a version called the Performer as well. It's a little bigger version. I know you don't have a pair of those yet, Matt, but you should try them. I do them. not. They're great. Okay. I like them. So again, if you want them, go to buyraycon.com slash IndyQ and get 15% off your order. It'll give you a little promo code. Put that in at checkout. You're going to love them. So you're Farragut. You have just commanded Craven to go on literally using signals go on and he he screws it all up and he makes a traffic jam he sinks everybody's starting to die and then oh by the way you're within range of the fort and you're starting to get unloaded on in a significant way now i've always thought oh well he's just kind of like chilling out there and he's like in control of the situation but that was not what was happening at all smoke was starting to just be everywhere and it was all drifting slowly towards the fort but the boats couldn't see they couldn't see to range where they were going confusion was starting to go crazy again the quote from farragut as you've heard is what damn the torpedoes full speed ahead and so what does that sound like to you what does that sound like he's saying it sounds like tim allen in galaxy quest saying never give up, never surrender, or whatever it was. <laughs> like, to infinity and beyond, it it sounds like absolute courage and fortitude saying, our strategy here is full speed ahead, charge. That's how it sounds to me. Okay, so I want to paint a different picture of what I think that might have been. This is an officer, uh, Lieutenant John Kenney, who was on board the Hartford, which was the boat that Farragut was on, he started climbing the mast so he could see the battlefield. So he was up in the sails, so to speak, starting to try to figure out what was going on. Or maybe the sails weren't true. I, I don't know how the, the Hartford was propelled. I haven't seen a picture of it. But this is what Lieutenant Kenny said was happening on board the Hartford at this moment in time when they were pinned down and the fort was unloading on them. Kenny says... A deadly rain of shot and shell was falling on the Hartford, and her men were being cut down by the scores, unable to make reply. The sight on deck was sickening beyond the power of words to portray. Shot after shot came through the side, mowing down the men, deluging the decks with blood, and scattering mangled fragments of humanity so thickly that it was difficult to stand on the deck. So slippery it was. Wow. Two observations. One... People were a lot better with words back then. That's just your normal guy, and that was poetic. Two, the unable to make reply part is very troubling. You're taking all of this action, all of this heat. You're watching people die, and there's not a dang thing you can do to even punch back or discourage the people who are killing you from continuing to kill you. Exactly. And so you're in charge of the fleet, and you're on this boat, and this is what you're seeing. Hmm. I have sent you a photo of the USS okay. Brooklyn. All right. And if you'll look at that picture, is a side profile of the boat. And I want you to look at all the little black dots on this. Everywhere there's a black dot, that is a spot that a cannonball hit directly. Oh. Maybe not even a cannonball. These could have been bolts. These could have been bullet-shaped projectiles. And the Brooklyn did not sink? 
did not sink. Does it make sense? Does it? I mean, like 30-ish, maybe? <laughs> yeah. And so it's hitting the mast, like the the center. You Look at that. They were shooting at the center mast of the ship, and they were hitting it. Just on that vertical beam there, how many shots do you see? One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven? Eight shots total up and down the beam, if you count that little one right under that crow's nest. If Just that is on the hit, mast. It's hard to make out. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so strategically, their intent was to cripple it, then destroy it. Oh, by the way, if you look up pictures from World War I, like these recruiting posters, there's one that has Farragut up in the mast saying, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Hmm. It's so thick, he's able to fire back at this fort. Plus, it's a fort. What's your cannonball going to do against this fort, you know? And so I would submit to you and and to anybody that would listen, the third chair, whoever, I would say that this damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, which, oh, by the way, there is no source that says, yeah, oh, without a doubt, that's what he said. I was there. Nobody says that. There are people that say okay. he may have said four bells, meaning that's the command to full go. Full speed ahead. Yeah, exactly. There are other ones that says, hey, I, I don't care if it's four bells, eight bells, 16 bells. I don't care. Just move. Like, there's an incredible mm-hmm. amount of debate over if he ever even said that. And most people agree that he did not. But the sentiment is the same. The command to go forward was given. And they said go forward over the torpedoes. So think about that. There's another component here. It's not just damn the torpedoes that full speed ahead. That was the better option. Yeah, Exactly. Craven just died. The only boat you know to have gone into the torpedoes just exploded and sank. He took a gamble. It, it was a foolish command. Go into certain death over the torpedoes. Because if we sit here, we're going to get killed by cannonballs. Well, that's the thing. I mean, what's the option? Full reverse out of a traffic jam? That's going to be slower and more difficult with that whole fleet. I think forward was his best bet. Exactly. But help me out here. What was the objective? What did they hope to get? Because they're not trying to take Fort Morgan, right? You're trying to get out into the open water of the bay. Because if you can get out into the open water of the bay, the CSS Tennessee is a ram. It's a gigantic, heavy, heavy ship that's well-armed. And your only bet to beat this thing is to outmaneuver it with more guns than it has. And that's exactly what they were trying to do. If we can get out into the open water, we can get away from Fort Morgan, get out of their range then we can go toe-to-toe with the Tennessee, the Selma, the Morgan, and the Gaines in open water. And to be clear... So they had a Morgan and a Gaines ship as well as a Morgan and a Gaines fort, correct? Exactly, yes. If they get to a level playing field out of the range of the two forts and they have room to maneuver, the superiority of their numbers should overcome even the very stout Tennessee. And then after they've defeated that little miniature fleet, What did they want to do next? Take Mobile? Yeah, and take the fort. That's the goal. But just think about that command. I I just want to stick right there on that. So damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, four bells, whatever it is he said, you're a sailor on the Hartford. You're seeing everybody die around you, right? Have you ever heard the Jerry Clower thing? I think I may have shared this with you about John that climbs the tree and he's going to get the raccoon out of the tree and it turns out to be a lynx. Have you ever heard this? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So there's this famous line that uh, he says in this, where he says, shoot in here amongst us, one of us has got to have some relief. Have you ever heard that? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of what I think Farragut was thinking at the time. So anyway, they turn tack to the torpedoes, they run straight across them. They said, the sailors on the boat, on the ship, said as they crossed the torpedoes, they could feel the torpedoes bumping the bottom of the ship. Oh. They could hear them, thump, 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 thump. Can you imagine what that felt like? Uh, like the siege of Vienna, hearing the sappers working underneath your walls and knowing that they're planting mines and that at some point it's suddenly going to explode. And then I don't remember what happened after that. <laughs> I don't remember either. It certainly wasn't the wing to SARS. And so <laughs> they're bumping across these torpedoes. Just imagine that minute and a half where you're traversing that torpedo field and you're like, I could die at any second. Not only Mm -hmm. is it possible, it is probable that I am about to die, but I won't take a cannonball in the face. (laughs) So, Have you ever been on a frozen pond or any kind of frozen water and then realized you shouldn't be out there? I have. 
I have. Yeah, it's very thin ice in Alabama when it freezes a pond over, like a cow pond. And as some stupid little boys, as we were younger, we used to go play on them. And we were out there over the top, and we realized how thin the ice was. Yeah, and there's that freaky moment where you start getting those pinging, cracking runs that you can hear shooting away from where your weight is, where you know, I can't stay here, but moving, it doesn't seem like a real great idea either, but you just have to get off that ice. To me, it sounds like that kind of a conundrum. Exactly. Damn the ice, full speed ahead. But they did it. They got out into the open water, and they bumped over the torpedoes. They did not detonate. Later, after the battle, they went back and they pulled the torpedoes out of the bay, and they found that one in ten were still dry. Hmm. So seawater had got to the powder. If I'm Jeff Davis, I am having a firm conversation with whoever built those. (laughs) Sounds good. Interesting, though. So they got out there, and then at that point, okay, so we're able to get away from the fort. Now we have to deal with the CSS Tennessee. And not only the Tennessee, but the personality of Buchanan, who has made it known, look, you're going to capture me or you're going to kill me. Those are the two things that are going to happen, but it's not going to be without a fight. I'm going to fight you till I die. Hmm. And so they started doing all kinds of stuff. They were shooting the Tennessee, and these cannonballs were just bouncing off the top of it. And finally, they hit it. I believe it was the Chicksaw. I read all these boards at the Fort Morgan historical site, so I read all these informational things, and I've got a couple of them photos here in front of me, but there's some of them that I don't have in front of me, and I believe the shot that did end the Tennessee was from the Chicksaw. I may be wrong about that, but the steering rudder of the Tennessee was controlled by chains, because that's that's what you're going to do. You're going to try to do whatever you can to, to immobilize the Tennessee, And so they started going for the chains of the rudder, and the Chicksaw scored a hit that broke the chains on one side of the Tennessee. So we could only turn in circles after that point. So if I understand correctly, they would open a door, poke a cannon muzzle Mm -hmm. out, shoot, and then pull it back in, close the door. Yeah, and those were usually going to be on tracks to absorb the recoil, and those tracks only went perpendicular to the side of the ship. So you had... I mean, there were, there were some mounted guns on naval vessels at this point that you could pivot, but overwhelmingly, you aim your guns by aiming the boat. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the inner workings of the Tennessee, but I do know that some of those doors got jammed, possibly by shots from other boats. And so at some point, they were unable to steer. They were unable to fire where they wanted, and so they were just there. And Buchanan got hit, and his leg was broke. He surrendered, one of the officers under Buchanan surrendered with Buchanan's blessing. But that was the last thing to happen in the bay. I mean, before that, the the gains actually was sunk. Well, it kind of, it beached after getting hit by the Union fleet. And then the crew burned it so that it wouldn't fall over into enemy hands. But the Morgan actually retreated back to the guns of Fort Morgan. It kind of hid under the fort, kind of like a a mama hen protecting her chicks with her wings. So the Morgan hid under the Morgan, which is interesting. And then later in the night, it snuck past the anchored Union fleet in Mobile Bay all the way back up to Mobile. The most interesting thing, in, in my estimation, happened to the Selma. And it actually surrendered... But there's a really interesting story about that. It surrendered to the Metacomet, the ship the Metacomet. But I want to read what happened there. And this is right off one of the boards at the historical site. It says, When Lieutenant Murphy of the Selma went aboard the Metacomet to surrender, he offered her commander, J.E. Jowett, I don't know if I'm saying that correct, J-O-U-E-T-T. Sounds good to me. He offered Jowett his sword. And Jowett, who was an old friend, took his sword hurriedly and exclaimed, Pat, don't make a fool of yourself. I've had a bottle on ice for the past half hour. Jowett, who'd been planning this for days, treated his friend to a, to a sumptuous breakfast of oysters, crabs, and beefsteaks. I think my favorite moment of the entire Battle of Mobile Bay was two friends who had probably trained together at some type of naval academy. They just had a battle to the death with each other. <laughs> when Lieutenant Murphy gets on board the Metacomet, he's like, okay, cool, yeah, let, let's have breakfast. You know, we just tried to kill each other, but let's take a minute and we're alive. Let's celebrate this moment. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting. And it's a microcosm of a lot of what you hear in the correspondence surrounding the Civil War. There were people who really wanted that to happen. There were people who really didn't want that to happen. People who wanted to find another solution or people who just accepted 
we're not going to be able to resolve our differences any other way. And there are just going to be about 10 or 15 decisive moments that are going to have to unfold. But it seems there was a sense of relief on the part of a lot of people to no longer be at odds and to have the question settled. And then obviously others like the radical Republicans in Congress, John Wilkes Booth and people who were mad about what went down from the Southern perspective, they obviously wanted to punish each other and continue to inflict damage after the conflict was over. But I like moments like the one you're describing better. There's this little microcosm of humanity, and that's the moment the CSS Selma surrendered to the USS Metacomet. And uh, I think that's really interesting. But Hmm. they surrendered to Tennessee. So at this point, you're the North. You still have a problem, and that problem is Fort Morgan (laughs) because it's still there. Right. You ran through the torpedoes. You got inside the bay. You were able to knock out the Tennessee, which, oh, by the way, they took over. And then they turned the Tennessee's guns towards helping in the siege of Fort Morgan, which happened afterwards. Did they rename it? Was it recommissioned? Oh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. That's that's a really interesting question. The USS up yours? (laughs) The USS Buchanan sucks. We got yours nanny nanny boo boo. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, I, I have no idea. But for the North, the problem was Brigadier General Richard Page, Robert E. Lee's cousin still hanging out in Fort Morgan. He proved to be an issue until, I mean, it was it was weeks later when that thing was given over. It was surrendered on, let me find the exact day, I think it's the 20, August 23rd, 1864. So the Battle of Mobile Bay took place August 5th. And so however many days that is later, 18 days later, that's when the fort was unconditionally surrendered. So did it devolve into a siege? Yes. I mean, they just choke them out or they barrage them or both? Absolutely. They went full on siege. And the way they did that is the Union started walking down the pinball flipper. They started slowly moving artillery into position. And finally, when they got rifled guns in position and they could just hammer away at one spot on the fort over and over and over, that's when Page realized, uh, this isn't going to work. And he unconditionally mm-hmm. surrendered. However, there were some issues with how he surrendered. I actually purchased a newspaper, two newspapers actually, from 1864, and there's an article. You did? Yeah, I did. It's really cool. So there's an article. How'd you find that? I just, I don't know. This stuff is out there. If you just find it, it cost me about 100 bucks per paper. I got two of them. I got one from August 25th or something like that, and then one from like September 2nd. Wow. It's so cool. You sit there and you read the newspaper, and you got, they were from Connecticut, It was the Hartford Chronicle, I believe it was. And so I'm sitting there reading the newspaper from 1864, and I'm, you know, hey, if you want to buy a cow, come down to this address. I'm looking for people to do my war service for me. You know, please inquire at this address, that kind of stuff. Didn't have phone numbers, Mm -hmm. right? It's really cool to just read a newspaper from back in the day. Farragut actually dispatched a telegraph message it would have been the equivalent of the Associated Press back in the day, right? So all the northern newspapers get this wire, and they broadcast the information. And I don't have it in front of me, but uh, the gist of the message is, okay, so we got the fort, but I am sad to inform you of the the brutal or the savage-type surrender of General Page. And he broke his sword, so he didn't give me a, a full sword. He broke his sword before he gave it to me. And also, after they waved the white flag, it looks like they may have spiked the guns. They were mad. They weren't happy that they had captured the fort. They were upset that it wasn't a gentlemanly surrender. It was like, you know, oh, he he broke his sword, and General Granger was the guy that accepted the, the surrender, but he wasn't happy about it. Isn't that interesting? So by contrast to the surrender of the Selma, it's pretty ugly. Yeah, exactly. The Selma's like, hey, my, you know, you win. Here's my sword. Apparently, the, we had the, to do this. We did it. We all played our parts. Now let's get breakfast. The the handing over of the sword apparently was a, a big deal, and and the fact that after the white flag was raised, the destruction of property that may have been used for the war effort by the other side that was a big deal. And this was before the Geneva Convention. This was before all this kind of stuff. So there was this law of war that I didn't know it existed, you know, I, I didn't know there were rules, but apparently there was. So there's the idea that y- you could be at war with another party 
and there's still this set of code that supersedes the conflict that you're having, and you know, we all agree to abide by these rules while we're trying to kill each other. That's such a strange thing to me. Yeah, well, I mean, if you don't have some kind of rules to it, then it feels like it's a de-evolution into complete savagery. It seems like those rules serve a practical purpose in terms of a little bit of predictability in an otherwise really unpredictable moment in life, but I think they also serve a psychological purpose in keeping people from going feral. Yeah, so that was it. That was the Battle of Mobile Bay, and so it happened in three stages. The fall of Mobile Bay occurred on August 5th, 1864, the fall of Fort Morgan itself occurred on August 23rd, 1864. So at that point, the Union had control of the bay, and that's when they began the siege of Mobile itself, which was on the left side of the pinball machine in our mental model here. And Mobile itself fell in siege on April 9th, 1865. So these are all dominoes that fell in order. And it all came back to a pivotal moment of an admiral on a ship that's getting slaughtered, making the decision to Mm. run across these torpedoes. And the fact that those Mm -hmm. torpedoes were wet may have affected the whole outcome of the campaign to overtake Mobile. So one person's job was to manufacture those naval mines, and the fact that one in ten of them were good and the rest were wet, that affected the entire outcome of that er the war in that area. Isn't that interesting? It affected the entire outcome of everything. So I think the North still wins if they lose at Mobile Bay. Oh, yeah. They muster another fleet and give it a go. But my understanding was that at this point, the blockades were in place to try to cut off all of the Confederate shipping, the supply lines, the logistics. But the ships could run the blockade out of Mobile Bay. And that's why they went around and started picking off all of these different ports was to eliminate this smuggling, this running of the lines. So the North is going to win either way, but, I mean, when is Appomattox Courthouse is, of course, when the war ended, Lee and Grant. When was that? Spring of 65? Yeah. I don't know the exact date. April, May of 65? So you're talking about nine months later, something like that, roughly. How much longer does this thing go on if the Confederacy is still able to move around behind the lines and keep people supplied? Grant effectively agreed to just lock down Lee. So Grant is neutralized. Lee is neutralized. They're sitting in Virginia. The whole thing hinges right now on this Union plan to end the war by severing all of these connections across the South. That's why Sherman's doing what he's doing. And if Farragut can't keep up his end of the bargain in Mobile, well, then what do we get? Another three months of war? Another 50,000, 100,000 dead? Do we get another six months, another year? How does that change the attitudes when people come to the table in ending the war and coming to terms? I mean, those nine out of 10 faulty minds have a pretty big historical spiderweb effect on a really dynamic, important moment in history. Yeah, and you mentioned the surrender at Appomattox by Lee. Now, I don't know if you were referring to that being the surrender of the Confederates or not, but it's my understanding that Lee did not think he was surrendering the Confederacy at that point. He was surrendering the Army of Northern Virginia. I didn't know that confusion existed. I don't remember that. That that started a domino effect of other people surrendering. So it's that's my understanding that there was a lot of nuance there. Like even Lee's wife was like, "Yeah, uh, he didn't surrender the Confederacy. He surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia." Well, that feels pretty willful and stubborn, though, because at that point, what was left other than the Army of Northern Virginia? I mean, all the resources were marshaled there. There was, I mean, I know people were still very willing to fight. That is well documented. But all the math on it, uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah, my point is there are a lot of people that care about the history of that stuff in very great detail, and I was just I was just offering a little nuance there for anyone who may be a student of that. I know history is your thing. I just found it to be a really interesting story, the Battle of Mobile Bay. In fact, when I was flying with the Thunderbirds down there, I asked Flack. I was like, hey, man, can we fly through Mobile Bay? It's an important thing for me because my family has gone down to that area for years And I would just like to see it from the sky and to fly through the middle of those pinball flippers and see off to the right Fort Morgan and know the huge role that it played in the war or in in the Mobile campaign. It's just, it's fascinating to see it from so many different angles. And so when I was down there last week, I took a, a little tiny drone and I flew over the top of the fort and I went up just a little bit, you know, tens of feet off the deck, looked at all the gun emplacements at the fort. 
it was later used for coastal defense in World War One and World War Two. But to see those original Civil War batteries and um, to see the areas where the gun emplacements would have been from the perspective of a Confederate that may have been manning the fort at that time of day, 6.47 in the morning. And then I also flew it out over the bay, and I looked back at the fort. I was like, oh, wow, this is what Farragut mm. might have seen. Man, that's interesting. Mm. And then I took it, and I flew it up north into the bay, and then I turned back, and I looked, and I was like, oh, wow, this is what a sailor on the CSS Tennessee might have seen right now, or the Selma, or the Gaines, or the Morgan. They might have been thinking this. And then I ran it slowly back up to me on the shore, and I was like, this is what it might have felt like to be on the gains as you were limping back to, you know, the protection of the guns of Fort Morgan, you know, knowing that you're about to sink. Or this is probably what it felt like is if you were one of the survivors on the Tecumseh trying to wash yourself ashore here right at the base of Fort Morgan because that was the closest land to you, and everybody just died on your mm-hmm. boat. The humanity of the moment is often lost when you read things in the page, but yes, I don't know, it's fascinating to look at it from a human perspective. Two things. One, you said history is my discipline, and that just isn't how history works. Mechanical engineering is your discipline. I I got nothing. But history is different. It's just everybody's thing, and that's part of why I like it, is because where it's very difficult probably to have casual conversations with anybody, any town you roll into about mechanical engineering, it's actually really easy to talk about the stuff that I spend my time thinking about with anybody because everybody's got a story. And that second thing you said, I guess, is my number two thing, and that is the humanity side of it is so fascinating because the more you dig, the more personal it gets. You just keep zooming in on these meta events and these huge movements in history. And eventually you get down to people who had a mom or dad or kids or wife or a sweetheart or some dude that they liked that they hoped they would come home from battle and they could marry someday and start a family with. I mean, everybody has all these dreams and ambitions at a very simple human level, beliefs about God, and the afterlife, death, not God, whatever it might be, a desire to start a thing, artistic impulses, dreams, ambitions, and fear of death. Everybody, no matter how confident they act, especially you know people of the age, of uh, fighting age, there, there's a, a healthy fear of what happens after and your own mortality, and it drives so much of human behavior and human behavior under pressure. And I really like that you just had the impulse to go out there with your drone and not just take pretty pictures, but try to think of it. You put that drone in different places to experience other people's perspectives. And yeah, that's something I respect about you. I like that you really care about trying to see things from the places that other people see it. And that's what a good historian does. And so you say it's not your thing, but you're good at it intuitively. And I just learned a whole bunch of stuff about Mobile Bay and I'm really grateful. Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for saying all those things. That's very kind of you. Can I offer a parting shot on this episode here? I accept. Well, it depends on what it is. I mean, if it's stupid, then no. <laughs> this this is what I want people to think about. Whenever you hear the phrase, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, you know, in the past, it sounds like a charge or a, a will to fight or overcoming adversity in a way that, you know, is just hard to believe the amount of bravery or courage in this person in the, at that moment. You know, we have to be very brave right now. I just want you to stop and think about the moment that those words probably weren't said. Let's start with that. (laughs) But the moment that that represented, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, was said in a very tense situation. People around Admiral David Glasgow Farragut were dying at a very rapid rate. It's possible that we say that phrase or that, that quote to mean one thing, and it completely wasn't because we take it out of context. It's possible he was experiencing fear. It's possible he was experiencing panic. He didn't have a better option. It's also possible that he was just very brave and he was smart and he rolled the dice on one in 10 torpedoes being good compared to 10 out of 10. I think it's important to understand the context of history. Context is king. So understanding the moment when something happens is very important to me. Good take. I appreciate that. I appreciate the whole thing. I learned a ton. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for listening, man. I appreciate it.